Good afternoon and welcome to Robbing Minds. My name is Isabella Adedigi. Now, it has been a tough one for Nigerians over the past few weeks and months um, from the increase in the price of goods and services to even witnessing the loss of businesses and homes as demolitions in Lagos State continues. And we've also heard of the increase of price of electricity in band A. And I'm sure when we speak to people, you know that the suffering is there. Um, the minimum wage has remained the same. And a lot of employers are asking employees to tighten their belts, even as they pay, in some cases, double, triple the prices for shelter, for food, for clothing, for the basic amenities in life. And Nigerians are asking, is this suffering short term or is it long term? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? When will this end? To discuss some of the plights and um, issues arising, I have with me joining us from the Abuja studio, a social commentator, Kemi Ateko. Welcome to Robin Minds. Kemi. Also joining us from the Abuja studio, We'll just wait thank for you. some. Um, thank it's you. nice to be here with you, Isabella. Thank you. We also have Dr. Odiako Obire, the president of Good Leadership Advocacy for Africa, GLAFA. Thank you also for joining us on the show from Abuja. Um, now we'll go straight into the conversation. Um, this past week or some weeks, we've been seeing some of the demolition going on in Lagos State. In particular, there's been a lot of um, news and tension around the Lagos Coastal Road that is supposed to go from Lagos to um, all the way to Calabar. We've also seen like the demolition of houses. Um, for example, I went to bed um, yesterday night in my own home in Mende Villa 1. And um, I, w I woke up yesterday in Mende Villa 1 as a resident and I went to bed homeless. Um, as you can see, some of the images that were just flashing, there was some interaction with the, the Honorable Commissioner. And I know that um, a lot of people have this kind of stories of being homeless as a result of um, loss of income, loss of shelter, as we know of the coastal road, businesses have been um, given, have, have been brought down. Um, to just discuss some of these um, sufferings, I just want to um, um, hear from you, Kemi Ateko. Um, you've seen some of the images. Um, what can government be doing to restore confidence in people's, um, re restore that confidence? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the images now, and this is the moment where the wall of where I was residing was pulled down. And we're having a conversation with the Honorable Commissioner of Environment, Okumba Wahab, and he was assuring us how some parts of the estate will be saved while only one line would have to go down. And you can see me there actually begging him for time, begging for 24 hours, for 48 hours, for two, two, two days, two months to get all our things. We were exposed. Um, the canal, the animals, whether it's the, the snakes or whether it's, it's, it's the monkeys and then the looters and the scavengers just waiting to encroach. And I'm just wondering that um, if leadership is about empathy, then why are some of our voices falling on deaf ears? Why are we seeing this impunity in some instances where People don't have shelter anymore. Even if there's a contravention on the setback, why isn't notice being given to people like me so I can pack my bags and ensure that my children are safe and I have a roof over my head? But um, as you can see, the walls were pulled down and the buildings came down. Yes, and in less than... Um, two hours, three hours, four hours, people were just pulling out as much of their possessions as they could. And I'm just grateful that I had a community that could support me. But I know that some of the families there were not as lucky as me. They didn't have people to to help them. And now they are homeless. And I, I really wonder, and I'm, how, when, when will this suffering end? And what next? Um, wh wh what's the way forward? 
Okay. When will our leaders listen to us and just try to meet us halfway? We want the best for Nigeria. We want the good roads. We want the development. But can there be leadership with empathy? Can you give us time? Things are so expensive now. And to have your home just ripped in front of you, I think government can do a whole lot better. So I'm not just saying this, but I'm saying this from a, a place of personal experience. And I know I speak for a lot of Nigerians going through similar situations. So um, I'd just like you, um, Kemi Ateko, okay. to just weigh in on some of these things that you've just seen, whether it's the coastal road or the demolition without notice. Okay. Uh, firstly, my, my, my son name is actually Asheku. Okay. Yes, Kemi Asheku. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, I honestly feel your pain. I feel the, um, you know, I feel, well, I may not exactly feel how you feel, but I do understand what it is to have your home ripped away from you that way. Um, with regards to the demolitions going on in Lagos State, with regards to environmental infractions, right? Um, from where I stand, I have been privy to some information that over the course of uh, a couple of weeks, right, and even for months, the Honorable Commissioner for Environment in Lagos State, right, had sent out some um, information, some of which also includes the fact that, you know, he had meetings with people in estates and all of that. Um, the fact is, you cannot take away the fact that people's homes are being you know, ripped away from their heads. But the challenge we face in Nigeria is we, we sometimes have a bit of too much lawlessness, right? And sometimes, even though some people will be in pain, right, um, it's important. No, my son name is Asheko. I don't know who spells that. But then, you know, even though some people are in pain, sometimes you cannot help but say, hey, why have, um, you know, these infractions in the first place? Can we do better as a people? Can we live within the law? You know, I have seen videos or, or, of the um, Honorable Commissioner where people actually built on drainages. And then when Lagos gets flooded, everybody laughs at Lagos. So there really is no easy way to do something as tough as what he's doing. And as a matter of fact, I don't envy him. But these things have to be done somehow as painful, you know, as it is to everyone. Thank you, Kemi Ashiko. Um, yes, it, it was a lot relieving some of that um, emotion there. Um, we do want the roads. We want some of these tough de decisions to be taken. Um, I can only speak from my case. Um, where the commissioner came to Mendevila Estate a week ago and he showed us the Lagos master plan. And he promised to go back to the governor to see, since we had our papers, to see how a part of the estate could be saved. And he did return um, yesterday on Saturday and showed us the documents and said, the governor said we could actually have some place of Ogudu, the other side of the canal, to for the setback, but only one line will be affected. But at no point during that engagement was there any mention that that demolition was going to take place at that very day. And I'm sure you saw me sort of pleading and begging because even if it was 24 hours or 48 hours to just pick up our things and the place is still secure for us that have children, elderly, sick people. Some people were not even Sorry, around. So in, in our case, we want the government to work. We want the government to do what's best for the greater good, whether it's making sure that the drainage is cleared, but there should be proper communication, transparency, and it shouldn't catch us by surprise that everything we've worked out for, hard for, just ends up going in the twinkle of an eye and, and people end up um, homeless. As you, you can see some of the residents, there are people that are tax paying, law abiding citizens. And I'm all for this government to work, but um, it is really sad that yeah. in that engagement and conversation that it was just a flick of a finger and then the, um, the walls came down. And I was being comforted by the Honorable Commissioner thinking that it was going to pause, but it didn't. But we'll move on now. We'll move on now to um, 
the issues around um, the coastal road. Um, we've just talked about something that was personal to me, which is a demolition that I know a lot of people are going through. But let's look at the, the coastal road. Let's look at how um, compensation and management of information, especially by the government, to ensure that we're not um, sending the wrong signal to foreigners uh, that want to invest in Nigeria, that their investment is not safe. And I would like um, you, Dr. Odiako, to weigh in on that. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me uh, this afternoon. Um, it, the, coastal, the, the coastal road, the Lagos-Calabar coastal road is, uh, is a welcome development because it's one audacious project that this administration has embarked on. Uh, the project is, the project has its positive uh, drive because when you look at the states that cut across this coastal road, uh, there are a lot of investments and activities that will happen in that corridor uh, when the project is, is uh, completed. Um, but however, however, uh, there is no, there's no pain, no gain, because what those that have property or investment in that uh, right of way at the moment, what they are passing through is, is a huge pain. But at the same time, it's a good thing that the government is engaging the people. Uh, the government has started paying compensation to them. Because if this road is completed, um, it, will, it will bring a whole lot. Instead of driving away investors, it will attract a lot of investors to the states along the corridor of that coastal road. And I, I, want to, I want to appeal to Nigerians that uh, there is nothing that is good that comes easily. So uh, it, this is just likened to a pain of a woman going through labor. Uh, there is so much pain in that, but after that, there is joy when the baby arrives. So I, I want to appeal to Nigerians uh, to be a little bit patient and look at the greener side of it, there is nothing wrong in having much developmental projects. Uh, but at the same time, I, I would still call on the, um, on the, the Minister of uh, Works to take a look at some of our economic roads. They are really, uh, they are really, some of them are really, really bad. And I think there is need for them to also have a full concentration on the east-west road, uh, the, the Bini Aushi road, uh, Portakot Aba road. These roads have high network of economic values. So there is need to develop, uh, there is need to come up with projects that will actually, in the long run, benefit the entire nation and the citizenry. Thank you for that. So. Even in the midst of the pain, Nigerians, according to you, need to remain focused on the bigger goal. But um, Kemi, I'd like to know where um, Nigerians are grappling with increased cost of food, of um, basic amenities. We've heard of the increase in band A. We've also seen um, inflation at a record high. We've seen what's happening at the Forex markets with the dollar to the naira. Um, what can the government be doing to cushion some of these effects? For example, the minimum wage has remained the same. What what short term um, things can the government offer to the people to keep that hope alive as we wait for some of the um, rewards from these um, sacrifices to manifest? Okay, um, just to quickly buttress what Dr. Um, um, Obiri said, right, um, earlier when he was talking about the coastal road. In 2023, the Chinese moved domestically, right, um, 465 million times via, via, via roads and rail and all of that, visiting other parts of China. And with that, they were able to get close to $680 billion dollars. 
One of the challenges we have in Nigeria today is the ease of movement. People are unable to move easily from Lagos to Calabar. Goods are unable to move easily from Benue to, to Ogun State, you know, and all of that. And that's why we have the increased cost of living. So if we have a road that cuts your movement, you know, by four, by, 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 by four hours, six hours, it means goods can quickly move from one place to another, right? That means that if, if, um, what you will have is a reduction in the cost of um, what people have to pay for moving around and for moving goods around. And I think that that's very important. With regards to the electricity, um, a lot of people I know are not very happy you know, with the um, Honorable Minister of Power, uh, Honorable Bayo Adilabu. However, um, if you're coming from finance into power, uh, you cannot move like a bull in a china shop, right? There is the part of it where you need to understudy and understand and then move in. One of the things that we must salute him for is the brilliance with coming up with a band A, band B, band C thingy so that not all Nigerians get to pay the same thing you know, for power. So that in what you then have is a situation where those who may be able to afford it have more power than regular, right, can then say, okay, we're taking the subsidy off. Because government as it is, people feel Nigeria is rich, but the truth is we are not as rich as we claim to be. So, so can you work at what of it should that government we be doing yes. to cushion some of the effects? Because for some, it's all happening at the same time. For example, minimum wage has remained the same, even as cost of living food, shelter has tripled, doubled in some cases. So while all these projects are going to take time to, for us to see the dividends, for us to see the benefits, what are short-term um, alleviation that the government can be providing to keep that hope alive? Well, some of the short-term things I know that government has provided so far is the 50,000 Naira grants right, that government has been distributing to nano businesses in the last uh, couple of weeks. And I do know that this is supposed to touch a thousand people per local government in the, in the 774 local governments in Nigeria, right? I know that some people have received the 50,000 Naira grant, courtesy the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Investment, right? I also do know that uh, that same ministry is giving out loans right, um, you know, to MSMEs and also uh, manufacturers. Now, what else can government do? I think that government needs to talk to the people more. There is need to continue to engage people. Um, no, if a person is feeling depressed, the first thing you do is not give them medication. One of the first things you want to do is counsel them psychologically, um, you know, evaluate them and speak to them in such a way that they can understand that there is light at the end of the tunnel, right? If people can hear more from government, if government can engage the people more and help them to understand that it is, like um, doctor said, it is just for a period of time and the people who built other countries, right, into what they are today, sacrificed at that time. And will we, in our generation, be ready to actually offer some of that, those sacrifices, then I think people will understand better and be on the side of government. Okay. Um, Dr. Odiako, I would um, like you to react to the issue around the minimum wage. Um, the NLC has submitted a proposal of 615,000 minimum wage to the committee. Would you say this proposed wage is realistic and fair? We know that... Um, a lot of Nigerians are employed in the civil service and the minimum wage does play a huge role when it comes to remuneration for a lot of people. Not everyone has businesses or can benefit from the 50,000 Naira. So where should the conversation be moving considering the minimum wage? Well, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I, I need to touch uh, on the issue of the tariff a little bit because... Um, uh, Nigerians actually at this moment are passing through a lot. Uh, from the, the removal of the first subsidy uh, to, to electricity hike and all that, uh, in the real sense, Nigerians are actually passing through so much. Uh, at the same time, we should also look at the bright side of 
the the government what they are putting out there for the people however uh, I, I i want to believe that it as much as it is very good for these bands to be defined but i think it's a little bit premature because uh some of the people that uh, are in this different bands uh, like me, I'm in band A, but I can tell you that uh, sometimes 48 hours I don't see light, and when light comes, two hours is gone, and I'm paying for a service that is not, is not there. Now, the minister, I, I think the minister have a lot to do. It's not just about um, trying to uh, see the possibility of making things uh, work in the surface of it, but the reality there is need for proper investment investors not portfolio investors we need the discos to invest i don't see any reason why i should buy a transformer i don't see any reason why i should buy electric pools for me to get connected to my house these are the duties and responsibility of discos they need to provide these things to connect me to electricity i don't need to buy them these are the investment they're supposed to bring to bear so if they are not doing this then it is very wrong of an investment they need to bring in funds and make sure the discos function effectively because when the services are provided nigerians will pay that's the simple truth then coming to the issue of of uh, labor the minimum wage um in us coming to the issue of labor uh, requesting for 615,000 naira minimum wage is really very, very unrealistic. Uh, everyone knows that. Even the neighbor, uh, labor, labor Congress, they know that. Nigerian Labor Congress, they know that it is not possible for any government or individual or private organization to pay a minimum wage of 615,000. However, that's the reality of things. Considering the inflation, but I want to believe that the labor should engage government on, it's not from right from Udoji time till today. An increase in minimum wage has always brought about inflation. So what labor should be engaging government at this time with is um, provide, uh, make sure that our refineries are working so that um, the cost of fuel, the cost of diesel, the cost of kerosene, aviation fuel, and all that will come down. Once that aspect is taken care of, whatever lift of the minimum wage that the federal government is doing, because the government of Tinubu is already doing great on that, is they are trying to put something forward why the, the discussion on the minimum wage is on. That is very fair, to be fair to, to the president and, and his team. Uh, they are doing well in that aspect, in that regard. But there is need to tackle the areas that are actually causing the inflation before you talk about minimum wage. Because if these areas are not taken care of, when you increase the minimum wage with all this burden, inflation will rise more. But they, there is need to look at it holistically. Thank you for that. Um, I'll move to Kemi Asheko. I'd like you to also weigh in on the minimum wage. Um, do you agree with doctor that um, this needs to be revised downwards or the concentration by government should be on tackling inflation as opposed to increasing um, a minimum wage? Well, um, whether we like it or not, the minimum wage will have to get increased at some point, especially considering the fact that subsidy removal, you know, and the harmonizing of the currency is there. It will have to, at some point, you know, be worked on. However, like Doctor said, 615 is a bit too high. Uh, of course, we have seen over the years how 
every time minimum wage is increased. And this is not minding the fact that not every uh, body who works works with the civil service. Nobody is going to take a look at the fact that it's only civil servants that get an increase in pay. Everything increases almost immediately when the minimum wage is increased. Uh, um, however, um, what the government is doing by infusing, you know, funds into the economy, especially with nano businesses getting, a th um, you know, the 50,000 naira grants each with the uh, MSMEs and manufacturers having access to uh, loans that have a long moratorium period and all of that. That is one of the things that we must appreciate the government for. But then again, right, I think that labor has to come, uh, you know, maybe down from the high horse and be considerate so that when people even hear how much they're asking for, so you're looking at 30,000 naira minimum wage to 615,000 naira minimum wage. I'm certain that any right thinking person, you know, automatically knows that that will not work. It's not, it will not correlate, you know, with the present reality. So I would say that, well, labor should take it easy with government. Government, I'm sure, have a way of, um, you know, coming together to make this happen. However, it's important to also note that the message, right, from the president during the um, Labor Day, I think he was represented by the vice president, you know, where he said he feels their plight. He feels our plight. We're all here in this together. But there has to be some sacrifice that he's made by we as a people. And then we can hope that indeed we will move on, you know, to greater heights from there. Thank you. I'll move to Dr. Odiafo. And this is to do with the lingering fuel crisis. Um, is there an end in sight, um, what needs to be tackled for this fuel crisis to be a thing of the past? Because 30 years ago, we had the fuel crisis and we still have it till today. What does government need to do to put this to an end? Well, the um, fuel crisis in Nigeria has um, become a trend right from a long time ago more than 30 something years we've been having the issue of uh fair fair crisis fair queue shortages and all that but um before the election we we nigerian experienced a very serious uh fair fair uh, situation and when the subsidy was removed um fear started coming in uh, but then, I think the, the marketers, the independent marketers and the NMPC uh, need to sit and speak in one voice. Because NMPC is saying that there is enough uh, petroleum product. Uh, however, there is a problem with the logistics. And when you talk about logistics, it's moving the product from one point to the other where people can have access to it uh, nigerians um they've they've moved on with the issue of uh first subsidy it has become a reality that we have to fuel our vehicles we have to fuel our we have to fuel our lifestyle and everything yes. Yes, so Claudia, we are buying the fuel we'll, we'll have to bring we are buying the fuel can we just wrap this conversation up, um, your final thoughts? Okay, great. Seconds. So, we, we, great. We are buying this fair, and um, they should make it available. Because some of, this, some of these challenges we are seeing right now uh, are caused also by the independent marketers who wants to increase their pump prices at will so because availability within is the past key. four or five days thank it, you dr Diakwo. availability within, is key when it comes to resolving the fuel prices and um, government needs to play a part as well as the independent marketers that's all we can take on this segment thank you kemi Asheku, a social commentator and thank you dr Diakwo obiri president good leadership advocacy for africa We'll take a quick break on Robbie Minds. Don't go anywhere. She's a mom. She's a social media influencer. 
a content creator, a writer, and a very devoted Muslim, and now the proud author of Oyibo Karimo. I'm talking about Oyibo Karimo herself, Morikoko. Welcome to Robin Minds. Hi, Izzy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, growing up, and we would always see people write about their lives when they're 60, 70. It becomes like a project, like, okay, I'm soon going to die. Let me write about my story. Let me share my experience and give some wisdom. But as a young mom, wife, content creator, why did you decide to write a book about your life? Um, not waiting till you were old and gray. Well, first of all, because the times are changing. And then also, I'm a big believer in if you have a story to tell, you should tell it because like I always say, you never know who you are inspiring by living your authentic self. Because at the end of the day, I've come to realize that a lot of the things that we experience, other people are experiencing it too. But, you know, the fear of, should I, will I, will I be canceled if I do this? You know, the fear of the unknown basically just keeps people from talking, you know. And so now I'm an advocate of changing that narrative. If you have a story to, share, to tell or to share, share it because you never know who you're going to be helping. Because at the end of the day, I feel like that's how... He, the human community is supposed to believe in. So that story and um, desire to inspire, to um, uplift the next generation. Now, um, it's an interesting title, Oyibo Karimo. And I know that Karimo is, or Kar Karimo. Karimo. Is, Karimo is the name of a street in a rural area of Suruleri, the Odrelegba area yeah. where you grew up. How did that shape your life growing up in Karimo? So, first of all, I would, the, the, the idea behind this book is not to say that Karimu is a bad place or Ujolegba is a bad place. It's just growing up there, I just, as a child, I've always felt like there was more for me outside of this community because that circle has a way of locking you in and making you think that that is all there is to your world especially since there weren't like a lot of role models around to understand so but as a child i knew that there was more for me outside of here i always saw the big picture how i was going to live i did not know you know but i always knew so the first was was my belief my mindset which then also um encouraged me to write this book because then it's not everybody who knows so now i'm just hoping that somebody will read it and then think that if if I could do it, then anybody can. And whatever the environment, it doesn't matter. It doesn't you can really aspire matter. to be whatever you want to be yeah. in life. Now, the book touches on things like motherhood, finding your personal person about career, purpose, and of course your devotion to God through your religion. Islam comes through in that. Um, why did you decide to share all these aspects of your life? Some people say, you know what, I can tell you about career and purpose, but when it comes to, you know, my childhood or my, my motherhood or my marriage, that's out of bounds. It's just, what's the purpose of saying, telling a story if you're not going to tell the whole story? And I understand that if you, I understand if you want to keep certain aspects of your life away from the world is being vulnerable is not a very easy thing because even at the end of the day there were some things that i was about to write and then it took so much courage you know but like i said i'm a big believer of i've made peace with whatever it is that happened first of all so you made it easy and so like i said i'm a big believer of if you have a story to tell you tell it authentically right so i just thought if i if i were going to share a certain part i might as well just have done that on my instagram because every time from time to time but i, I wanted an all-encompassing medium you know where people could everybody has friends everybody has gone through one thing or the other with family a lot of women have had children so whatever it is that you think that you might be going through i feel like there's a segment or a section for you in it and that's the purpose of the book so that you can just find some sort of semblance in it and maybe some sort of just that solidarity to know that these things happen it's just life basically that 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 took a lot of courage um and and i wonder um 
what sort of support you received during the writing process? Like you said, there are times you were holding yourself back. You're not so sure because when you write a story about your life, you inadvertently expose other people in your life, your husband, your mother, your friends, your colleagues, your family. Um, were you able to get their support, their blessing to sort of bear yourself in that book? Huh. Blessing. <laughs> so I'm trying to pick my words so that it doesn't come out, uh, come off as somehow, but if there's anything that I've come to realize in life is that you don't need anybody to go ahead or permission to live your authentic self, right? At the end of the day, people will either catch up or they will let go of you. Regardless of whatever the outcome is, everything is okay. Um, but if you're wondering whether I got support, I got a whole lot of support. My husband, he was always there. My mom, she was always there. Because, you know, to, to live your truth as a mom of two toddlers, you need all the support that you can get. So that I had from my family. Or whether I go ahead asking for permission. You know, that one was between my um, God and I. He gave me the go ahead. He gave me the words. Like I keep even always saying, this book is God's project. Because I remember when I finally decided that I was going to write the book. I knew what I was going to write. I knew what I was going to talk about. But then knowing what you want to write is different. Then actually being able to put the pieces together is another different thing entirely. So then I remember thinking, do I actually have so much words? to type, to be able to form an actual book. You know, that was one of my major worries. But then every time I opened my laptop, the words just kept on pouring out. So that was my sign that God is, because cause the other day I was reading, uh, the, during the final rounds of edits, I was reading the book and even I was inspired. I was like, wait, did I, did I actually write this? So that was the go ahead that I feel like I needed from God. And then I had the support of my family and every other thing is just, excuse me, it's just secondary. <laughs> So you, you say you read the book and you were even inspiring yeah. yourself. Can you share some of the inspiring moments that have that have come to shape when you book a remote? Wait, what do, what do you mean inspiring moments? It could be inspiring moments of your childhood or of something you went through in motherhood, something that you've read and has inspired you in the book. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example now. There was an incident that, like I was telling a couple of people the other day, that, that happened to me in uni, right? And it was so turbulent. It made me so sad. I was always crying up until the point where I would just slip off on my praying mat and stuff like that. But easy now, if you ask me to tell you what that issue was, I can't. And it's not because I don't want to tell you. It's because I genuinely don't remember. And so when I was writing that in, in the book, I referenced it to the point of which a lot of times your problems aren't as big as your mind is making it to be, right? Because imagine something that was making me cry. I remember that I was crying, oh, but what the problem was, I don't remember. If it was that big of a deal, I would remember where it was. So from that, even I had been able to inspire myself to understand that whatever comes, it'll pass. I just have to be strong enough to know. I just have to be present enough to not let my mind play tricks on me and just seeing the problem for what it is. Because I don't know, I, a lot of times it's us just, we're just overthinking. Most of the times, I think, in my opinion, in my experience, the problems aren't really that big of a problem. And this is not to trivialize whatever anybody is going through. I'm just saying most of our problems are, are, are minor. So I was reading that part of the book the other day, and I was like, hmm, okay, wisdom, I see you. So that's what I was trying to say, where even I was reading it, and a part of me was, was inspired. I think I can relate to that, because in everything, you can choose to see um, the glass full or as the glass empty. Yeah. You can choose to see that silver lining, even when it feels like um, your world has come crashing down. Yes. Now I want us to look at friendships because um, you referenced, you know, where you were growing up and you said it's, it's not to say that Karimu Street is a bad place. Mm. So um, were there friendships that have endured the time um, from your childhood? And can you tell us about that? Quite a number of them. And then, you know, life happened. Some of us had to like go different paths. Some people boarded in school. Some people the friendship cut off, and then we we um we connected along the line. So yeah, some friendships have been able to, even though there was like pauses in the middle. And I'm still like, I remember the other time I was searching for one of my friends' name on the internet because I'm like, I need to find this girl. So you know, I'm still hopeful for I don't know 
the connection that might be in the future. But uh, yeah, some friends definitely to the test of time. Okay. Now let's move to motherhood. Um, can you give us um, just wet our appetite? What can we expect? Because um, motherhood as a mother, I know is so multifaceted, whether it's the um, pregnancy period or childbirth, or as you said, raising toddlers, like um, you ask most parents and they say they're just winging it. So share something from the book with us. Well, I honestly am just winging in it. But in the book, like I said, this book is the most vulnerable that I've been. And then one profound thing that I spoke on about motherhood that I don't think I've read in any book because uh, um, but a lot of moms are, just, are speaking about it now. But I don't think I've read it in any book. It's the issue of breastfeeding. I'm just saying it as an example to let you know how in-depth that I went according to the experiences that I have had. You know, because you think, oh, when you give birth, it's just going to be normal for you. Like breastfeeding is a normal thing. You go for your antenatal, you see bre um, uh, breast milk is best milk. But then nobody tells you that there's a possibility that after your baby comes, there's no breast milk. No, but even in the antenatal, sometimes they leave it out. So then I'm there expecting to breastfeed my baby because everybody has told me breast milk is best milk and then the milk is not coming out. And then the nurses are asking me, should I give this baby formula? I'm like, no, doctor said breast milk. And then what that happens is if the baby doesn't age during the first hours of life, they, they start to have a low sugar, which is not healthy for the baby. So at the end of the day, you're giving the baby formula and then you're feeling guilty when you're just supposed to be enjoying, you know, the the process of birth to life that, that just happened. So I put in the book, and I'm not saying don't breastfeed your baby. I did mine. But I'm just saying it's not all the time what they, what they tell you to be. So I just say a lot of things that is as, 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 as it is and as it happened for me. Okay. Um, you're out there in the media, the, um, the work you do as a content creator, a social media influencer, a writer, um, now an author. And one thing you can't takeaway is love and relationships. And that's something you um, delve in the book, finding your personal person. Um, how did you find your personal person? When you say how, what do you mean how? had me and my husband met? Yes. Well, we met um, through my, my family friend. Well, you know one of those, I call her my cousins. You know one of those people where you're so close, but then you start to call each other cousins, but then you are, aren't actually cousins. Yes. Yeah. So she was serving and he was serving and then they met. They became friends, and then we went to visit her friend, and then the rest is history. Like they just like say. that, you just met, and then how and did then, you know it was the one? How did you like? How did you nurture that from friendship all the way to marriage and now kids? We we dated, collected numbers, talked from time to time, and then I feel like when you when you know, you just know, and I just knew. And here we are today. Well, some expose, um, you did work together. So what was that like working and dating the boss? I, mm -mm, don't say it like that. What, he was your employer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were who? serving. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> so, so because I've told you my secrets now, you want to use it against me. <laughs> no, it was, when you say working and dating the boss, you say like, I went to the office and then I started dating the boss. So we were already an item before I started working, you know, with the company. You understand yeah. so so how did you manage the dynamics because i'm sure there are some people that did not have that context well we spoke about it about about the whole um kind of played the scenario out and when it was time to work we worked and when it was time to play we played we were able to strike a balance we were we were, we were serious about it. i feel like if you put your mind into and then when we saw that it was not well it was supposed to be again we i had to work somewhere else and yeah. Okay. I, th I think it's good that you clarified that, that you were already dating before. Oh, I even friend self before you dating, before the working. So it was, I didn't know go to the office to date the boss. <laughs> and it didn't have anything to do with you being employed because you are suitably qualified. Uh, no. And even because he had to, um, one of the reasons why I had to step in was because because the, the business was still budding at the time and he had to go to school to do his master's. So he kind of needed family on ground. So I also had to step in to do that. So that's one of the reasons, again, why, why I, I chose to work there. Now, let's, let's move to another thing you explored in the book, which is your purpose, your career. Um, while I was introducing you, I read out different things because you have different facets. Your background is in mass communication. You're an author. 
social media influencer, content creator, I'm a mom, and I and now you're you're a chef. So growing up, you're always told to be that one thing. How have you been able to embrace your multipotentiality? I think I just I surrendered. If if that doesn't sound too deep, I just surrendered because you know in your head. You know where in your head you know that there's so much you can do. And then there's this, uh, is it an adage or a proverb, jack of everything, master of none, you know. But then along the line, and that's why it's, it's always good to read. And I'm an adv advocate of good books will literally change your life. You know, whether it's books, whether it's podcasts, something that is sharpening your mind. New set of information every day because then I now realized that the adage was cut short. So jack of all trade. Master of none is better than master of one. Because the fear is that if you do everything together, you won't be good at one thing. But then there's some of us who can't just, you can't just do one thing. I don't, I started out as, as creating uh, uh, comical content, you know, but then I would go somewhere and then they would refer to me as a skit maker. I was a skit maker and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with being a skit maker, but then there was, I just felt like there was more. So at the time where my skit making career was, Budding, I said that I was going to stop it, which some might have considered as a career suicide because I didn't like the conditioning that it was giving my mind. You understand? And then in stopping that, I was able to have a clearer mind, to be more creative, to do more things. And I feel like if I was still vividly, um, actively, sorry, touring this kid path alone, I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have gone to culinary school. I wouldn't have been a an all-round creative that I am now, you know, but I just knew that there was more in store for me. So I think the summary is when you know, you just know, and if you know, surrender, there's no point fighting it because a lot of people is like, oh, everybody expects me to be like this. Oh, everybody expects me to do this, but what are you supposed to do? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Uh -huh. So I just, I just surrendered and just allowed life to do its thing. Mm. And in surrendering, you've been able to explore different facets of this creative career. Now, I know that something that comes through in the book is your devotion to God. How has that shaped you as a person? It's everything I know. That the relationship with God, my devotion to God, my, my connection to God. I've known him since. I've had sense. And I didn't know that now, but I now know that the reason that I knew him then was because of the kind of life that he was, uh, he had, he had him plan for me. God is everything I know. God guides almost everything I do. And I say almost because at the end of the day, I'm still human. I can only try my best, but like the roots, the base, the, the foundation of my life, of the trajectory of my life is as a result of the relationship that I have with God. Mm. I'm you, you've touched on several things in this book, and I do think that um, you bearing yourself gives it a lot of credibility because it's one thing to tell people how to live their lives, another thing to show your experience and let people um, draw inspiration from it. At any point, did you feel like I shouldn't be writing this book? Did you encounter any setbacks? And what kept you going? There was never a time where I felt like I shouldn't be writing this because it was, it was a long time coming. And if anything, every time... There was always signs along the way. Like one time I was, I was writing, because I wrote the book within the span of two years. So it was, was when I was writing the book, um, my husband asked me for a certificate. So in the process of looking for it for him, I found a journal of, like a journal that I've had, like an 11 year old journal. So I'm like, you know that, you know that feeling when you have, when you just go through your journal? So I'm like, oh, let me just feel good. And let me see some of the things that I wrote. And then I saw there that I, I said I was going to be an author. And I wrote that 11 years ago. And I write like short articles in the journal. And then beside it, I would just put author and my name. So if anything, it was just signs along the way that I'm supposed to be doing this right now. So there was actually never a time where I felt like, there were times where I was exhausted. Because I have, I had to do. It was a, I had to do so much at the same time. But there was never a time where I felt like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Mm. No. And I, I think finally, um, 
what's next after writing the book? Are we expecting you to go on the road? Um, how can people get copies? Is it only available in Nigeria? Where? Um, just let us know what next now that the book is out. Well, you can get the book everywhere that you get your books in Nigeria. Um, Roving Heights, most especially the book nooks, or just your basically your, your, your bookstores in Nigeria. And then if you're outside of Nigeria, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, if you don't like to read paperbacks, we have the e-versions. Uh, the audio book is in the works. We're supposed to release it, but some technical issues. So that should be coming up in like a few weeks, maybe a few tours here and there. And I'm just hopeful. I don't know what's next. I didn't know I was going to write this book when I started writing it. So like I said, I surrender. On that note, I'll just say congratulations, Miriam Bakri, a.k.a. Mori Koko. And all the best with Oyimbo Karimo. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we'll be calling it a day on Robin Minds. My name is Isabella Adedishi. Thank you for joining us. Do tune in next week. Bye.